How many of you all are bicycle riders? Good. How many rode here on a bicycle? <laughs> Welcome to Great Cities Institute. For those of you who may not know me, I am Tennessee Cordova, Director of Great Cities Institute. I want to welcome you here. We know that biking has become even easier than it's ever been in the city of Chicago. Uh, we have with us today Sean, uh, how do you spell that? Wydell. Wydell, all right. He's with the Chicago Department of Transportation. And he is going to tell us all about the new bike infrastructure. And I'm sure we're also very interested to hear more about the Divi program and how that's working, what your plans are for expansion. But we're very pleased that you took the time out of your, we know, busy schedule to be here with us. We very really sure. appreciate it. So thank you very much. And with no further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Um, so I'm Sean Waddell with the Chicago Department of Transportation, but I was talking um, with Dudley and others about water because I actually have a water resources background. Um, I'm, I have a, so I have a weird background. I have a finance degree. Uh, I was a commercial lending officer for a while. I was not fulfilling. So I went back and got a master's degree in water resources planning. So I was a water resources, uh, a watershed uh, planner for about 10 years before I came to the city and started working here at the Department of Transportation. I actually oversaw the Natural Resource and Water Quality Division at the city's Department of Environment, and now I'm at CEDA. All right, um, I'm gonna go through some information. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some background, talk about um, some of the problems we have with bikes and bike infrastructure in Chicago. We were talking a little bit, you probably heard us as we walked in, talking about dooring, crashes, stuff like that. That's the ugly side of things, but it is a reality, so I'm gonna talk about it. And then I'm gonna talk about complete streets, some of the solutions we've come up with of actually putting them on the street, and then also some legislative initiatives. And then finally, uh, bike share. And they're all actually, all those things are integral parts to making it safer to bike in the city of Chicago, including having a bunch of people on big divvy bikes. Because more people out there, more people recognize, more, more motorists and other bicyclists recognize um, bikes, and they start paying more attention. So. Uh, just some basic statistics about Chicago, 2.7 million people, we're the third largest uh, city in the U.S. We spend about six $800 million on transportation every year, um, and we are, and this stat is kind of out of date, although I don't even know what place we're in, I will admit, but we're usually in the top three for con traffic congestion in the U.S., so, you know, something to be really proud of. Um, <laughs> but uh, something that we're working to uh, improve on. Uh, there are usually about 40 pedestrians and about 10 cyclist fatalities per year, and also obesity is a problem, so lack of activity is a problem with our population. Um, it's also a public safety problem. So um, this year it's been relatively, we've been relatively lucky, but and as we add, up, add more infrastructure, people are paying more attention, they're riding more safely, um, we've had, uh, three fatalities to date um, on bicyclists, but you know we'd, we'd like to get to the point where there are no fatalities um, for bicyclists or pedestrians in the city of Chicago. Um, so we're 163rd out of 200 for safety, um, and over 130,000 crashes per year involving autos, 3,000 involving pedestrians. Speeding is a major issue. Um, I know that we're rolling out speed cameras, and um, all I can say, I, I've heard some of the preliminary data right now, we're in the warning phases, um, and some of the preliminary data is pretty astounding, the number of warning tickets that are going out for people speeding in the city of Chicago. And I'm, I'm not even gonna quantify it, but it's thousands and tens of thousands, I think, at this point. Um, and that's just in the warning phase. Eventually, those are gonna be real tickets, and hopefully, will translate into people slowing down, because that's the reason we're doing it, is really to get people to drive more safely. Um, the graphic at the bottom kind of gives you a, a little uh, demonstration of how at vehicle speed, as vehicle speed increases, uh, the distance to stop uh, also increases, and so the fatality rates are much higher um, the faster someone is going. Um, I, we were talking a little bit about doing earlier. Uh, bike crashes, there's, there's usually about 13 to 1,500 bike crashes per year. Um, and in, uh, with Doring crashes, there were about 300 in 2011 and 251 in 2012. Uh, this year, so far, there have been three uh, fatal bike crashes to date. 
Um, so what we're doing is really, all these things are meant to help solve that problem or to help reduce the uh, incidents that occur of bike crashes and pedestrian crashes. Um, the main words you need to look at here is, and this is one of our approaches, complete street policies. The main words you need to look at are the words in blue, but it's basically using complete streets to balance the safety of all users, um, especially the most vulnerable. Um, and that's just a graphic on the bottom showing how some of the work that we can do. Um, but this is basically the key right here is all users shall be accommodated and balanced. So some examples of complete street uh, approaches with pedestrians, we use countdown signals and safety campaigns. Um, transit, we're rebuilding, we're implementing BRT. And cyclists, we're adding new bikeways and bike sharing, which is what I'm going to mostly talk about today. Um, the complete streets design, uh, the key is really we put priority on designing for pedestrians, then transit, then bikes, and finally autos. And this is obviously a relatively new approach to um, transportation, at least it's, you know, as you look and you see four lane wide or eight lane wide uh, streets that look more like highways, obviously that this has not always been the policy and the approach in Chicago or, or nationwide. Um, so Complete Streets is one of the uh, one of Chicago's bike renaissance uh, approaches, and it's part of the mayor's transition report in 2011. It was actually to improve street safety, build 100 miles of protected bike lanes. I'll talk a little bit about that. Build bikeways for uh, all that are comfortable for all ages and abilities, and then introduce a bike share system. So the thing that's of interest and the thing that we're trying to do is you can see, and I'm I'm probably in this. I'm old and stupid to some extent, but or so they're strong and fearless, it's not one of the categories, but strong and fearless and enthused and confident, those are the people who are gonna bike no matter what the conditions are. I'll bike, for the most part, most places, although there are people who are much more, um, much more willing to be uh, a little more dangerous than I am. I'm, I'm a careful biker, but I will bike pretty much anywhere in the city. Um, the, the group that we're trying to do with, with uh, Complete Streets and all the programs and Divi Bike Share, the people who we're trying to capture are the interested but concerned. And that's about 60% of the population are people who, who have at least they're interested, they would consider biking, but they're a little afraid, there's not enough bike infrastructure, there's not dedicated bike lanes, um, and so they're a little bit concerned. And then we recognize this, this wedge is the 33%, no way, no how. Those folks are never gonna ride a bike, no matter what you do, no matter how safe, how, you know, you could put barriers on either side that are this tall and they're still not gonna ride a bike for whatever reason. Do you and, have data yeah. about broke, that broken down by age and trend data, does it show that people are, as the younger people entering into age where they can be traveling are more open to being bicyclists than I think so. I mean, I think people especially over, people over eighty probably yeah. aren't, right? You know? Right. No, and I think um, millennials, which uh, describes many of the people in the room today, that you know, many do not want to own a car. They want other modes of transportation, and we hear from companies on a regular basis that the reason they want to locate in Chicago is because of the bike infrastructure that we're adding. It's actually an economic development tool too. Um, this data, I think, is from Portland, but it's shown it's it's basically been shown in many surveys all over the country that that's roughly about the breakout that you see all over the place. But we don't have a lot of other good data on it. So protected bike lanes, this is just an overview of one of them. This is a uh, buffer protected bike lane where the cars are actually pushed out and the uh, cars actually, are, this is a parking lane, the cars actually act as a safety mechanism to protect the bicyclists. <coughs> And I'm going to go through and show some real examples, too. These are some of the protected bike lanes we've installed. Um, Jackson Boulevard, 18th Street, Elston, and Lake Street. And I'll actually show uh, Dearborn, which is our first two-way uh, cycle track or bikeway in a little bit. The main thing, and this kind of goes to some of your points, is that we're looking to make it safe for all roadway users. And you can see that in New York, in Montreal, and in DC, um, cycle tracks are another, time, another term for protected bike lanes. Um, cycle tracks people believe are safer, easier, and more convenient and would go out of their way to ride on them. And all those things are really uh, key in that 
they are safer, first of all, and they also, if there's that perception, more people are going to be willing to try them and use them and bicycle um, for all of the positive reasons that I've talked about. So some buffer bike lanes that we've installed in the city on uh, Division Street. Um, you can actually see this is buffered on both sides. This is to get to keep the uh, bicyclists out of the dooring range, and then there's a buffer also on the traffic side too. And there's a variety of different configurations, um, but generally this the lane near the parked cars is to keep people out, keep the bicyclists out of the dooring range. So if you're riding one of these, you should actually ride outside in the center of the lane. And same thing here. And sometimes we put buffers on both sides. It really depends on this, the uh, footprint of the street and what we can actually fit and accommodate in the, in the width of the street. So buffered bike lanes, I talked about this a little bit, but um, motorists generally park closer to the curb. Bicyclists ride outside the door zone. Again, these cross hatches are, to keep, uh, to, are an indication to bicyclists to stay out of the door zone. And there's greater distance and better sight lines. So another thing that we're trying out a little bit, um, and the first one is under construction right now on Berteau, right, Sarah? Is it the neighborhood right way? Yeah, uh, Berteau Street. So on the, on the north side, I think that's 4200 North. Um, it's, it's basically, uh, this is the first time we've done it in Chicago, but they've done it in Berkeley and Portland, low volume residential streets that encourage uh, cycling. In some ways, in some cases, it's actually, you can go in both directions. It may be a one-way street, and I think Berteau is a one-way street heading west, but bicyclists can go in both directions on it. Um, but there's a lot of traffic calming, there's bump out islands, and there's other techniques like this, uh, pedestrian refuge islands that are put in to actually um, get the motorists who do drive down the street to slow down. Um, so the Streets Recycling Plan uh, was released in 2012. It's an over 600 mile network of neighborhood bike routes and there's, pro there's the different colors and I'm not going to go through them all, but we've got um, cross town bike routes, we've got spoke routes, and uh, you can basically, and we've got neighborhood routes, so you can actually get within, between neighborhoods, you can get across the city, and then there's things like Milwaukee Avenue where you can get all the way out to the edges of the city safely. Um, and the goal of the Streets Recycling Plan is to have a bike facility within a half mile of every Chicago way. So, um, one of the newest ones uh, projects that we did, this was uh, last December it was put in, and we've made some changes to it, and I've actually got some updated photos too. Um, this is Dearborn Street. So Dearborn Street runs north uh, in downtown, um, and it previously had four traffic lanes and a bus lane. Um, and that's the previous configuration. This was done in December of last year, and then this is the new configuration. So we took out the traffic lane, we, moved, we bumped the parking out. We actually put in buffers, so there's, it's, it's a barrier protected with posts. And we now have two traffic lanes, and then this is supposed to be a bus only lane, but of course, like all bus lanes, it's used for everything, including buses, but not exclusively. Cyclists go in both directions on that? Yes, they do, uh, and I'll get to that. There, I've got some better pictures, but yes, their cyclists can move in both directions on Dearborn. It's pretty cool. Um, and this is a closer up shot. You can actually see um, bicyclists can run in both directions. They, there's exclusive bike signals. Uh, and and this, the, the vehicle turn lane has its own signal too. So that when the bicyclist has a green light, the vehicle's got a red turn arrow. So it can't turn it into the uh, bike traffic. What uh, have you found that people the bicyclists, in this case, obey their traffic safety. They do. It, um, it was in the notes, and I forget. I think it's, it went from something like 30% to somewhere in the range of 60 to 80% of bicyclists actually obeying the signals on this uh, on, on Dearborn Street. How so, far does it go? What, what's the length of it? Uh, it goes all the way down to Dearborn Station, which is 600 south, I think, and then it goes north to... Uh, yeah, across the river, yeah. like uh, Kinsey or something like that. Does it go all the way up to Harvard, Hubbard? I can't remember. It actually, it does end, and because at, at um, once you get into River North, uh, basically, the Dearborn bike lane does end. It becomes a one-way bike lane going um, 
built. And it's not protected anymore. It's just the paint, the painted bike lane. Um, so the other thing, another thing that we've done is in areas where there's potential for conflict with vehicles, um, we've actually put green paint boxes on the ground. Um, and so this is actually an alley. It's to alert both the bicyclists and the motorists coming out of the alley that this is a, p a potential conflict zone and that they need to pay attention. Um, and so this is, I think this is right around, that's Lake Street in the middle. Road, so. To the row on the hill. Oh, is it? It's oh, yeah, you're right. Road. Okay, and that, yes, so and that's Amalgamated Bank. So it's, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so the other thing we've done is, it's kind of like if you've ever been to England and you always look the wrong way when you're trying to cross yes. the street, which I definitely have done. Um, we actually put, uh, we put uh, thermoplastic words on the ground at all the major crosswalks that actually have look bikes and arrows on both ends so that people know they should be looking in both directions. Um, probably one of the biggest, when I ride the Dearborn uh, bike path or uh, Suck track, the biggest issue I have is pedestrians still have the tendency to step out into the street because they think, oh, now I'm safe, there's not cars coming, so I can actually stand there, and then they end up getting in the way of bicyclists, which obviously can cause conflicts too, and there's nothing, certainly a bicyclist doesn't want to hit a pedestrian just like, um, you know, so it's, it's a concern, it's still an issue, and that's one of the reasons, this was one of the tools we uh, installed to deal with that issue. Uh, we also put fiberglass plates on the bridges at Dearborn. In fact, most of the bridges over the river now have plates like this. And these are, um, it's, a, it's a complex issue because the, the way the bridges are balanced, you actually need, you can't use steel plates, you can't use concrete. The fiberglass plates are very light, they're actually relatively cheap, and they can be bolted down onto the existing bridge without having too much impact on the weight, so the bridge still operates. Um, but there's no, these are, these metal grates, when you're, if you've ever ridden on them, can get kind of slippery when you're riding a bike, especially if it's raining outside. And so they, it, this is a much safer, it's textured uh, fiberglass, it's a much safer environment to ride on. So, we are uh, collecting data on some of the cycle tracks and protected bike lanes. We're looking at safety data and use data. Um, we're also, as you probably saw, this shot here, for example. Right now we just have um, fairer protected, but they're just uh, removable posts. So as we um, study this more, as we figure it out more, the next logical step is to think about putting in actual concrete curbs and more um, hard barriers to protect bicyclists. Um, we're not there yet. We're still collecting enough data to make sure we can prove it. There's also a significant cost increase to put in a concrete curb over a, con over a barrier. Um, but some of the things like we've done where you put a, a, a lane of parked cars actually is just as good a protection as a concrete curb. So we're we're still learning from this. We're we're still sure. Like there are rules in the world for drivers, and there's a pamphlet. Is there a pamphlet for bicyclists? Bicyclists are basically supposed to uh, obey all rules of the road, the same as the as motorists. Because like some of us were taught by our parents, with which we're not always taught the rules. I I mean, me driving. You know, with me and my husband a lot in the city, mm -hmm. we have saw drivers almost, you know, like, I just knew he was dead, <laughs> you know, because, I mean, I'm sure there's a right way and wrong way to do anything. I think if you gave him a pamphlet with yes and no, I think people would actually read for the safety. And we do that. I'll, I'll get to that a little bit, actually, on some of the safety measures we do, too. Sure. I was going to say, are they incorporating uh, in the rules of the road uh, what uh, drivers are supposed to do mm -hmm. in terms of bicyclists on the road? Because you know, each group should be held responsible right. for obeying right. the rules, whether right. they're bicyclists, bicyclists or car, you know, auto mm -hmm. operators, because, you know, a lot of people really don't know the, the rules right. of the road as they relate to bicyclists. And, and especially with new, and I'm sure you've talked mm -hmm. all about that, uh, but the, mm -hmm. it's like the pedestrian crosswalks, mm -hmm. you still take your life into your hands if you just walk out because you can right. never be sure that the person is actually going to stop even mm -hmm. though it says state law uh, right and that I've seen you know I've seen traps in particularly in Forest Park I've, I've actually participated as being one of the walkers 
to go out and have the police and pull people still over. Alive. Hmm? You're still alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, but you know but so people I mean the problem being mostly that this is new stuff and people simply don't know how to behave. Mm -hmm. they see new stuff. No, I I would definitely definitely agree, and that's true of everything I'm going to talk about, including bike share. So mm -hmm. you know there are people who rent. Divvy bikes, who I sometimes wish wouldn't rent Divvy, rent Divvy bikes when I see them riding <laughs> Divvy bikes. But it's a system that's open to everyone, and um, it's it's definitely a learning curve. On all these, all the things that I just talked about, the things that I'm going to talk about, um, people don't quite understand all the different infrastructure that we're putting in yet, and it's it's definitely, and it's also, I mean, it's partially a. a it's about respect and that there isn't always a respect. So it goes, I mean, everyone needs to respect everyone. That's ultimately what all this comes down to, but we're also trying to make it safer for everyone um, with, the, with the things that we can do and to raise awareness along, uh, amongst all populations. So we recognize that some of these safety measures that I just talked about aren't gonna do everything. So one of the things we did this summer, um, there was always, a bike and pedestrian uh, safety ordinance at, in the city. Uh, there were simple requirements like you have, if you're 12 years or older, you have to ride on the street, um, things like that. But we realized that there were some holes in it. There were some things that didn't match up with Illinois state statutes, statutes and there were some other challenges with it. So what we did is we, we made some amendments that, that uh, brought into compliance with Illinois state statute. We also recognized that bicyclists also break the law the fine structure before was a bicyclist could only get a ticket of $25, which essentially meant that cops didn't write tickets to bicyclists. But the bicyclists were kind of getting free range, and as we've all seen, bicyclists who do things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and so we actually raised the fines. It's now a range of $50 to $200 uh, for bicyclists who break traffic laws. $50 to $250, i am sorry. And then we talked. I talked a little bit about Doring's. The other thing we did was we actually doubled the fines for Doring's. So it's um, now three hundred dollars if you door someone, and it's a thousand dollars if you actually cause a collision. So, um, and I think that I was uh, I forget where I was reading recently, but with Doring in particular, I think there's there's more education we need to do because a simple thing like open your door with of your car if you're driving with your right hand because you have to reach over like that. If we could get people to start thinking that way, just like they think when they put on a seatbelt, they get in the car, they just automatically put on a seatbelt. I think things like that are also important too. Um, and then the other thing we did, I, I mentioned that we've only had, um, <coughs> we've had some uh, divvy bike crashes this year, and the only time I've been hit by a vehicle was a taxi. So one of the things we actually did was um, put together this look sticker in partnership with a design firm uh, named Minimal, and one of their employees was actually killed in a Doring incident about a year ago. We worked with that design firm to put together this sticker. Every taxi in Chicago has these stickers on the, the rear uh, passenger door, on actually both sides, um, to alert people when they get out of the cab to look carefully before they open the door. <coughs> and then finally, we have a program called uh, the Bike Ambassadors. And bike ambassadors are basically go out and go to block parties, they go to farmers markets, they go out and they do bike safety and education. They, they show you how to fit your helmet, they show you how to um, ride carefully, how to check your bike and the safety of your bike. Um, and it's actually, the bike ambassadors, so I've, I've worked for the city for five years, I've worked for CDOT for two years, and I actually took one of the bike ambassadors, who's someone who now works for me, did a presentation about a year and a half ago about how what you needed to do to bike to work. And so I rode the brown line every day, but I never biked to work. I biked on the weekends, I'd go for 30 or 40 miles every weekend. And it finally, listening to that and realizing it's actually pretty simple was what it took for me to bike to work. And now I do it every day. Um, but some basic rules of the road in answer to the question that came up earlier. Um, 12 years or old, you have to ride on the street. Always ride with traffic, obey all traffic signals, and stop for pedestrians and crosswalks. And there is no helmet law in the state of Illinois, but on your own personal bike or on Divi, we strongly recommend that you wear a helmet. And I didn't wear my helmet when I rode out here. Although I admit I forgot it this morning when I ran to another meeting. But 
but <laughs> it happens. Um, but I actually keep, so I keep an extra helmet um, in my office. So I have one that I keep with my bike that I ride to work. I usually just leave it in the bike room, but I have this one in my office that I can get um, whenever I need to uh, go out and run to a meeting. So, any questions on bike infrastructure, bike safety, anything that I just talked about? Have you had complaints from motorists who use Dearborn that they have less space now to drive? Not too many, actually. I mean, we've had any new infrastructure, you're going to get pushback from people. We're, you know, we get pushback on to be bike share stations on a regular basis. Um, but, Sarah, I don't know, do, do you remember? Because you were here when we were working on that. Do you remember? Do you remember that there was backlash? Yeah. No, I think that was one of the things that the project was applauded for because uh, it was appropriately sized so the traffic volume was going through. Right. Because you actually had four, four traffic lanes and a bus lane before. So now there's, the, given the amount of traffic, it's, it still is appropriately sized. Um, and we did it in the middle of winter, so no one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, no, it, it was in downtown Chicago, so people knew. I mean, it wasn't like you can't hide when you're doing a project. But like it took that, me, so. I didn't notice until this summer. I mean, I was a pedestrian, not yeah. bicycle or driving. Right. Well, maybe even driving. And I didn't notice it until one day. I think, in fact, I saw it in the paper about it, and then I said, oh, yeah. We did kind of a soft launch in December of last year where we put it out there. We actually painted the lines, and um, so some of the paint came up, and we had some other challenges with it. But it was just to kind of try it out during the, the lowest biking season um, in December and, and through the winter. And then we actually went in this spring and put in like the look bike sign and, um, and, and uh, paint on the ground to actually alert people. We also improved their places in the road that had dips and potholes, we filled all those in, we made it much more safe and hospitable. But we kind of just wanted to test it out first before we, we invested a lot of money in it, and now that we realize it works, we've actually gone back in and improved all the markings and everything. So. Just a question on yeah. the safety issue. Uh, the Divi stations seem like they have uh, some level of technology built into them. Was there any thought to uh, like making uh, before the bike, once someone rents a bike and before it unlocks, making them watch like a minute or ninety second safety tutorial on where to where to ride and about like the dooring zone, or or even including um, like uh, bike helmet nooks for them to also. Rent. Yeah, we've um, so we're doing it. We are right now the the video or the. Um, the screens and the kiosks that we have are not sophisticated enough, and actually, more supposed, they're actually sophisticated enough to play a video. It would drain the battery, um, so they're all all the stations are solar powered. It wouldn't be able if you had that many transactions. It wouldn't be able to um, handle the battery. Would, would, the battery life wouldn't last. Um, but what we are doing is actually we now have a um, when you sign up on the Divi website, you can actually uh, when you get to that. Um, the confirmation page, if you get a membership, you actually, there's a link to the How Do I Divvy video, which has all that information in it. We're also right now doing a safety video contest, so if anyone here is interested, um, there's a safety video contest where you can submit a short video, I think it's 30 seconds or less, about safety, um, and we'll be having contests. We may actually, if, if they're really fun, we may do a viewing party, um, but there's prizes and all kinds of other things. So we're, we're definitely working to educate people, we, we're concentrating on kind of getting Divi out first. Now we're working on safety issues. And we're also um, considering there's a couple different prototypes. There's a uh, helmet hub, it's called, which they're just trying in Boston. Uh, I think somebody from MIT designed it. And there they're doing helmet rentals, um, which I'm a little dubious. Um, because I'll wear bowling shoes because I wear socks with them, but wearing a helmet on your head, I don't know. Anyway, but um, so that's one of the uh, we're looking at that either rental or really low cost helmet sales. Um, right now, we're also partnering. Um, I think we just we either are or will be soon partnering with a couple different helmet manufacturers for uh, coupons for reduced uh, helmet costs. Um, so we're we're working on that. It's it's definitely all these things are definitely things that we're considering and working on. We're just trying to also roll out a system at the same time. So and I'm only one person, as Sarah knows. I'm literally 
I am the bike share manager and several other programs. So, um, so I'm going to talk about Dooney. You've all seen the bike now. Uh, it is, as Sarah can also attest, it is the city flag blue because we got the Pantone exactly right because there's no, uh, no way we could have not because we would have never heard the end of it. Um, it's a great bike. It's a 40 pound bike. It's chunky. It's a three speed. Um, and, but it has a lot of, it's easy, it's a step through frame, has a basket on the front, um, and it's part of the mayor's vision to create a world class bike network and increase cycling. <coughs> um, I talked about some of these things, but as I, as I said earlier, part of the vision and part of increasing safety and part of everything we're talking about is um, all of these things. So establishing 100 miles of protected bike lanes, and we're at uh, 48 right now. Um, as of yesterday, when I checked in with the bike lane people, that was where we were at. Um, creating bikeways for all ages and abilities, and then launching a robust public bike share program. Um, bike share in North America, just some context. Um, Chicago launched on June 28th uh, of this year, so just about three months ago. As the third largest system in North America, we launched with 69 stations and about 700 bikes. Um, most of these, like Los Angeles, Long Beach, San Diego, those are all planned systems. They're not in operation yet. Uh, Montreal is in operation. DC is in operation. Uh, Minneapolis Nice Ride is in operation. And New York is, of course, in operation. So, what is bike share? I think you probably all know this, but the key thing, and this we were talking about this earlier, about the 30-minute limit, um, or the 30-minute uh, ride, and that is because this is meant to be a transit system. It's meant to get you from A to B. You can pick it up at one station, drop it off at another station. For example, I picked one up at my office and I rode out here. Um, and it took me 10 minutes to get here. And it, that was probably 15 minutes less than it would have taken if I walked. It would have probably taken me 25 to 30 minutes to walk out here from my office at Washington and LaSalle. So, um, that's why we do the short trips, is so that we have bike turnover, so we always have bikes available for people. If you want um, to ride longer, there's a small uh, fee for additional use, and that is, um, it varies, it's either $1.50 or $2, and I'll get into that a little bit. But the other question that may come up, especially as we're approaching winter, is that this, the Dippy Bike Share System is going to be available all throughout the winter. We're gonna reduce the size of the bike fleet. All the stations are gonna remain open, except if there's a huge snowstorm, um, and then we'll shut it down and we'll let everyone know that it shut down. But, you know, it's, it's really meant to be a transit system. We want you, if, if there's a station there, we want you to know it's there and to know it's going to be there and that there's going to be bikes for you to use. So, yeah. I'm sure this isn't the way it's meant to be used, but if you're about to run out of your 30 minutes, can you park your bike and then pick up another bike at the same station? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's the other thing is we are trying to increase, you know, trying to encourage turnover. But yes, if you are out and you're at 28 minutes and you need to go another two miles, you can always stop at a dock and get a new bike. You can even take out the same bike. You can dock it, wait about 30 seconds, and get the same bike out. So you can even leave your package in, in the basket and pull it back out. Okay. Um, and it's especially easy if you are a Dimmy member where you get one of these keys because you don't have to go to the kiosk, you don't have to do anything. You just stick the bike in, wait 30 seconds, stick the key in, get a bike back, get the bike back out. Okay. So, now members pay? I'll get to it. Okay. I'll get there. <laughs> um, have you considered making it a little longer? Because I feel like that's the one thing, one sort of complaint that I've heard across this platform of people and stuff. Right. You know, where I live in, um, you know, a lot of, I have a lot of friends in Logan Square, like, to get to a downtown job, like, 30 minutes actually isn't enough. So, right. I know that New York's is 45 minutes. I don't know how, you know, where you came up with the, where the matrix is to sort of... Yeah, um, overall, most other cities, most other cities do a half an hour. So, um, New York with 45 minutes is actually longer than most other cities. D.C. does 30 minutes. Um, a lot of other cities do 30 minutes. Uh, we're... On the other hand, you know, we are, we recognize as we roll this out, this is a grand experiment in Chicago, and we're figuring that out. So if it, if it looks like, the reality is, and I'll, I'll get to this, but um, I think it's in my last slide, but the average trip length is now, it varies from day to day, but it's between 15 and 20 minutes. So people have figured it out. Yeah. We don't actually, other than tourists, 
And I'm going to say thank you, tourists, for helping us fund the Digby Bike Chair system. Other than tourists, most people get that and okay. understand. And I, I know it's kind of an inconvenience. I definitely don't. I'm not, de you know, debating right. that issue at all. But we're and we're still evaluating that, and we may actually make it longer. Um, we just haven't decided yet. We're, we actually want to get some data. We've only been open for about three months. We want to get some data first before we make any right. major wholesale changes like that. Now, you just announced the number of stations you have in bikes. Uh, is there a plan to uh, do more? I mean, because this might be where you are in, at this point in time, but what, what's your actual, actual number and do you have one for expansion? I'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, I will get to that. Yep. So, um, Divi is meant to be convenient. We're putting stations where people work and live. Um, Union Station, a lot of our traffic, so one of our largest stations is at Union Station or and also at um, Ogilvy because and those stations are like 30 docks um, and the reason is a ton of people come in on trains they want to, they work in the east side of the loop or in streeterville or somewhere down on north michigan avenue they don't want to wait on a bus they can actually bike it in 10 minutes or they can wait on a bus and it could take half an hour or they could walk and it could take half an hour um, and so that's one of the big uses for it right now we're also putting in a neighborhood so that people can get from one neighborhood to another um, very easily uh, as I was starting to talk about a little bit, the bike is incredibly comfortable. Um, it's a step through design, so you can actually ride it in whatever you're wearing. Um, skirts, suits, um, anything is comfortable. Um, and the it has a basket on the front where you can put parcels. Uh, pricing, in answer to your question, you can do, there's a couple different options. One is the $75 annual membership. Um, that is unlimited rides of 30 minutes or less for an entire year. It's 20 cents a day. Um, it's cheaper than one month of the CTA if you get a full, the full price uh, pass for a CTA. So it's a great deal. Um, we also offer, if you just want to try it out, it's $7 for a 24 hour pass. And that's unlimited rides of 30 minutes or less during 24 hours. And you can take, as, you can take the bike out as many times as you want. You have to dock it every 30 minutes if you don't want to get charged any additional money. So it's also obviously sustainable. Financially, we're working on that. Um, it's also an eco-friendly transportation option. So, um, and then from a financial standpoint, we're we are currently working with a, probably about a dozen different companies and looking at some uh, potential sponsorship for the Divi system what would happen potentially if they do sponsor it. These, the sharrows here, and this was by design, these sharrows were always meant to be kind of a temporary measure with the hope that this would become advertising and if someone's willing to pay us three million dollars a year that we can then plug into the bike share system to expand it even further, add more bikes, add more stations, we're willing to um, make that design change. Um, and that we're actually, I think, fairly close to finalizing with uh, one or more companies. So, uh, and that is, you know, uh, that's been done in different places in different ways. City Bike, obviously, in New York, is City Bank. Um, the bike is named City Bike. We did not, when we started, we did not actually have a, a sponsor for the system. So we decided we would build a strong brand instead. So we worked with. Um, IDEO, which is a local, it's actually an international design firm, and we worked with Firebelly, which is a local design firm, to actually come up with, we had about a dozen different names for the system, um, and we tested them out at CTA stations, we asked people what they thought, and we ended up with Divi, which means Divi it up, kind of chop up your commute into slices, divide and share, um, share your ride, all those things, that's, that's the idea behind Divi. So, um, obviously, Divi, it's already shown benefits to Chicago. Uh, we have created about 150 jobs. The city actually owns the system, so we own all the bikes and the stations. We are paying a company called Alta Bicycle Share to operate it for us. So all those vans that are being driven around, those are Alta Bike Share uh, employees. I am literally one person, and I'm working, I'm the city's person running Bike Share. But I couldn't, obviously, I can't drive vans and rebalance and fix stations and do all that because I'm only one person. So that's why we pay Alta. Um, but they do all the logistics for us. We work closely with them. We meet with them a couple times a week to actually talk through. Sarah sat in on a bunch of those meetings. 
they're actually really fun meetings because they're really an engaging team, they're really great to work with, um, and they're doing a really good job from our perspective. Um, but if they don't, the contract at some point, uh, if they don't at some point, the contract is performance driven. So there are incentives. If the system makes money, we share the, we share the profits, and um, they're expected after the first year to actually make money off the system. And it's the split kind of changes. So we actually, the first year, the city takes the risk. So if we lose money, the city covers it. Um, but we also get the reward. So during the first year, we actually get more. If the revenue of the split is like we get 90% 90, 90 of it, I think, and they get 10%. Um, it flip flops as the years go on because then they're actually taking on more risk. Um, but we have really strict performance standards as to what we're expecting them to provide the services and as far as um, the time when the station is full or empty or other things like that. So, making it happen. Um, as I started to talk about, the stations, and, and it's kind of been answering answer to your question, the stations are easy to install, but they are solar powered and wireless. So everything on there, it's not hardware to anything, it's just basically set on the ground um, and assembled together. Um, and they are portable, so we actually, um, had some, com you know, we, so we installed the Serenos. We actually launched on June 27th, um, Thursday night. It was a special event for just the founding members. Um, the next day, the Blackhawks had to win and they had to have this little celebration downtown. So we literally picked up two or three stations that were along the route because we didn't want them to get destroyed since we had just put them down. So we pulled all the bikes and we pulled the station, pulled about three or four stations, especially along Washington. Um, it's not something we want to do, it's, it's come up again, uh, the marathon's coming up in a couple weeks. The marathon organizers wanted 10 stations moved, I then told them it cost X dollars per station and suddenly they only wanted one station moved. Um, obviously we're interested, we don't want to impact anyone, we don't want anyone to get hurt tripping over a station, but um, we also wanted to make sure they were using logic when they made their decision, not just saying, eh, move them because there is a cost to us to move them. So we also, um, and we're, we're still figuring out, I will say, we're still figuring out how we're gonna do it for the next round. We're gonna have, by the end of this month, um, actually by the end of this month or, or the middle of October, we'll have a total of 300 stations and 3,000 bikes on the ground. One of the things we did and one of the tools we had last year is we actually had this website where people could request a station. They could suggest where they wanted to have a station. Um, we got several thousand station locations, but of the 300 stations that we ended up with for this year, we about 80 to 90 percent of those were actually suggested by the general public on this website. So we actually were pretty close to what people were asking for. We of course couldn't get as far out as people wanted, we couldn't get as far north, south, or west as people wanted, but we're working on that. Um, we try to make stations convenient to users, we put them on sidewalks where possible. We also, as I said you know we're learning so we learned throughout this whole process when we were first citing them we were looking for a sidewalk that was 16 or 18 feet wide i think sarah may have been involved at the very beginning uh, with that and we realized you can't find a 16 or 18 foot um, sidewalk in chicago so we then reevaluated the station's about six feet wide with bikes in it that leaves six feet for people to walk if you do a 12-foot sidewalk. And so we've found that that's actually appropriate. That's more than you need for ADA compliance. It's actually, ADA compliance is about four feet of clearance. So you've got plenty of room for uh, pedestrians, wheelchairs, anyone trying to get down the sidewalk. Um, we also tried to put the stations close together and then looked at resident suggestions. Um, so we put uh, stations at CTA stations. This is the Southport Brown Line. And it didn't end up here, but it ended up somewhere on the sidewalk right nearby. This was just a sample. And I need, one of the things I have is I, there's now 250, 60 stations out, and I don't have pictures of them, so I don't actually know what they look like installed on the ground. So that's one of the things I'm gonna have an intern doing soon is figuring, is documenting that. So if someone calls me to say something about a particular station, I can actually look it up and see exactly what they're talking about. And by calling, I mean complaining because that's usually what it is. Uh, so we put them on wide sidewalks. This, I think, is at the Chase Plaza. Um, and we actually moved these bike racks and put the station there. And then um, 
took out some parking in some cases. One of the other interesting things about siting, um, and uh, interesting in a sort of maddening way, is that each of the stations we put on the ground, we ran through the alderman in the ward where it was being installed. So we had we actually got the approval of every single alderman for every single station that we installed. Um, and in some cases, I don't know if anyone, since I'm in this every day, the ward map's changing in 2015. So in some cases, the station was going to be in one ward now, and it's in another ward in 2015. And depending on whose ward it was, we actually had to run it by two all of them. So we had 300 stations that had at least 300, and, you know, closer to four or 500 different things that we had to get approved by all of them. So, um, it's an incredibly complex process. We're working through actually figuring out how we can streamline it in the future because it's, it's a challenge. Um, so bike sharing, uh, this kind of just gives you an idea of what we're looking at uh, as far as station density in the central business district and a little bit of river north. In the red, where you have 20 stations per square mile. And then as you get out into neighborhoods, it's more like five stations per square mile. Um, but our goal is, and this I actually need to update, we are actually going to be from Devon on the north, so 6300 north, to 63rd on the south, and then west to at least California, but actually probably further west than that in some areas um, by next spring. And we're, going to, we're actually going to have, we have enough funding right now to do 475 stations and 4,750 bikes. So. That, I mean, that's really just the beginning. We just put in another grant application. I was talking about this earlier. We put in a grant application with Oak Park and, and Evanston together, along with the city of Chicago, with the goal of actually expanding west um, towards Oak Park and into Oak Park, where Oak Park would have Divi stations too, and then expanding north through Rogers Park and into Evanston. Um, so We've, we've put in that grant application jointly with Evanston and Oak Park. Their boards both supported the application, um, and we hope that that'll get funded so we can actually grow north and west um, and also link to the same system. So you can actually get on a train down here, you can ride up to Evanston, and then you can ride a dippy bike around Evanston if you either live there or if you want to go shopping in Evanston or go to a movie in Evanston, you can take a bike from the train um, to the movie theater. So this is a terrible map, but I can't fit it all on one. But this gives you an idea. This is uh, the 400 stations roughly where they, where they would go with Devon up here, 63rd down here. And then this is California. But we actually go further west in several areas. And we'll, one of the things we're, that we're, walk, uh, we're walking through right now is figuring out, OK, so we've got this pod here. You can see they kind of end right here. And then we've got these here. So should we fill in between them? Um, this, I think, is the Kennedy Expressway, so it's a little rough. It's certainly a big border. Um, it's not always that safe or hospitable of a biking environment, but we're actually working through that, trying to figure out where exactly our service area should be, what, how far we should extend, and what parts of Chicago we can get to. Ideally, you know, in some day, we're, we're at, uh, we'll, we will be, be at least 475 stations. We're actually talking about um, in the range of five, six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred 800, 900 stations at some point. Um, we've been successful in getting funding so far. Most of the funding has been federal funding um, with local city match. And so we've been successful in that. We hope to continue doing that to expand it further and further so that Divi is everywhere in the city. So how does it work? You buy, you take, you ride, you return, and you repeat. Right. Um, so, as I was saying before, there's a couple different options. You can either get an annual membership, $75, and you get a key like this. Ultimately, and, and since many of you are university students, we're actually working on figuring out how to get either get that in your university fees so that everybody gets a daily membership, or um, working on some other different opportunities like that. We're, because we just launched, we're probably going to roll that something like that out in spring or in the summer semester, the summer, um, or even for next fall, because we're trying to figure that out. Um, but if anyone's interested in talking about that more, and you happen to be in student government here at the University of Illinois, uh, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. Seven dollars is the cheapest, right? You have to. 
You have to pay seven dollars every time you want to ride for half hour. Yeah. So it's actually it's a better deal to buy an annual membership. And we one of the things we do is we offer we offer reduced price memberships. You don't have to pay seven dollars if you have an annual membership. It's seventy five dollars for one year, and you don't as long as you keep your trips thirty minutes or less, you never pay again. Um, but we we also do corporate memberships. We've done some university memberships with a couple of universities where we can give discounts to students who are interested in becoming members. And that's something we're working on too. Were there any talks with CTA about um, offering a joint pass that would work for transit and Divi? We've talked a little bit about that. Um, I think uh, CTA has is they're interested, but they're having challenges with Ventura right now. So um, integrating Divi into it too, I think, would be more than um, is feasible right now. But I think over the long term, that's the goal: is to have the idea. You know, we've. Ideally, you'd have, I, I don't know if any of you have the U-Pass, but ideally you'd have just a U-Pass that would help work at Divi, would work on all the CTA, PACE, Metro, everything, um, but we're just not there technologically yet. Since this uh, is a price share between the government and the local uh, folks, so how does that play in when people are outside of the city that are going to be using the service, like you said, Evanston and Oak Park? So would they have to then pay into the system, or you know, what would be their? You know, we're yeah, we're we're still figuring that out. the The grant would help pay for the stations and the bikes that would be installed in Evanston and Oak Park. Right. Um, there's a couple different ways we can approach it. We could actually have them install the stations. Our team actually runs the operations, and then we keep all the money, any revenues. Are, so that's one way to do it. The other way is based on who signs up and what zip code, there's actually, you know, we split the revenues sure, between, you know, yeah. So we're, we haven't actually, in all honesty, that was one of the questions that both of those uh, suburbs asked, and we haven't decided yet. It's, it's really something we need to negotiate. We just, we literally had two weeks to write a grant application. We just needed them to say yes. We want to be part of this, and we'll figure it out later. That's all we got to at this point. So when was this happen? If this happened. Uh, when we get the grant, no. When was the grant? You know, we before? put the grant application in about a month or a month and a half ago, but we won't actually hear anything until February. So we've got time to talk oh, it through. Okay. Yeah, we've got time to talk it through. Um, so just to finish through this. You buy a membership, or you get, um, or you use your credit card, get a bike. Um, there's a little. You use this the key that I showed you. you. Insert it here. You wait for the green light, and you just pull the bike out. You lift by the seat, it pops right out. Um, and or the other option is, and you can kind of see these are numbered buttons. If you're using your credit card for a seven-day pass, you go up to the kiosk, you swipe your credit card. It'll give you a code, and then you just punch in the code on these buttons right here. Wait for the green light to take your bike out. You ride, and everybody rides Divi, as you can see. And then you return, and that's just a station. Uh, that's a station at the da Daily Center Plaza. That was our first station where we had our launch event. Uh, we do have smartphone app apps. We have a Spot Cycle or Cycle Finder. They both work. You can actually find out. You can kind of see here, you can actually see how many bikes are available and how many docks are available. So when I was coming out here, I actually pulled out my phone. I looked at it to make sure that I was going to be able to get a dock at the station down at Jackson um, in Peoria because I didn't want to get out here and have a bike. If you do get out here and there's nowhere to put your bike, the option is there's actually on the station, there's a button that says station full. You just press the button and you get an extra 15 minutes to take the bike take your bike to the next nearest station at no charge. So, Some basic bike share facts. Um, <clears throat> in DC, in particular, DC's had a system up for almost three years now. In fact, I think they just had their three year anniversary. Um, and uh, it was just about a week ago. And more than half of their recent bike share trips were for non-work purposes. So people are using them for everything. The common use is you ride them to a restaurant, you eat dinner, and then you take another bike. Or you ride them to a bar, and then you find another way home after you've been to the bar. There's, you know, don't want to encourage any behavior that uh, could be unsafe. But um, Capital Bike Share members also save a lot of money. They, you know, got rid of people get rid of cars. They uh, don't take public transit as much. They don't pay for taxis. 
um, and so they save a lot of money in doing so. And then finally, um, I said it was the third anniversary of Capital Bike Share. I think last Thursday, they were um, they were actually the second largest bike share system until, ironically, last Thursday we became the second largest. So they're now the third largest on their third birthday. We were a little happy about that, but uh, anyway. So we've had, as you can see, it's it's been pretty phenomenal. We've only been around three months. We've had 395,000 trips, and this was data as of. Um, I think Monday night, but we had 395,000 trips, over a million miles traveled, um, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we also have almost 9,000 members right now, and uh, 200, as of today, I think it's 264 stations on the ground. So we'll have 300 in the next, uh, in the next couple weeks, basically. So that's pretty much it, unless anyone has questions. In the winter time, are you worried about the freezing of the of any of the parts or the rubber or something? Uh, we are a little bit. In fact, um, just this morning, just this morning, I. Uh, ended up having a last minute meeting, but I scheduled a conference call with uh, the op the um, Nice Ride Minnesota. They don't operate year round, but they actually operate in win if you've been to Minnesota, winter lasts until <laughs> June. Yeah. Um, so they they operate in, they start I believe in April. They, they basically put the bikes and stations back out and they had snow after that last year several times. So they actually have a snow operations plan. So we. We've had, I just had a conference call on that this morning, and then I also um, talked to the bike share manager from Toronto for the same with the same question, like, how do you do this? What's the best practices to make sure that bikes aren't available? Bikes are available, the snow is cleaned up, people can use them, or at what point do you actually just shut down the system? And you know, if you're gonna get 12 inches of snow, you just wanna shut it down. We can do that remotely. We can actually turn it off, we can actually tell people social media, on the website, on the apps, the smartphone apps, we can actually tell people it's off. You can't use it right now because well, it's unsafe. Besides the snow itself, I'm just thinking of the actual freezing, the temperature. I mean, especially when it dips really down, is, does that start to affect the mechanism for looking at the... It really shouldn't. Um, it's more, my bigger concern is streets and sand. Um, and snow plows. That's my biggest concern is the, the operations of snow plows and salt. Um, I ride my bike probably three quarters of the year and as long as it's around freezing or warmer, I actually am out there riding the same bike. It's my own personal bike, but I ride it every single day and it doesn't really have any impact. And th these are well-built, sturdy bikes. They actually should be okay in the snow. Um, we will be actually reducing the size of the fleet because the salt is actually what can do the most damage. So we'll be reducing the size of the fleet and keeping track of which ones we have out in the winter so that we can put them back out next winter rather than potentially damaging with salt another batch of bikes next year. What are you anticipating the length of the longevity of a bicycle? When will you need to replace it? I think Capital Bike Share is three years old and they still have most if not all of their original bikes so i mean there's obviously wear and tear items that we're replacing um on a regular basis already but most things we're not replacing and we don't expect to replace for three or four years at least uh, so how do you handle flats you know flat tire or are these tires you know they do have some run, run on tires that, that, that these are not run on tires but they do they have um, I think they have Kevlar in the tire and then um, so they're less likely to get punctured um, if you do find a bike that's has a flat the and I let's see if I have a picture of it here uh, anyway if, if you oh so right here if you have a flat or any other problem with your bike, the best thing to do is to actually take it to the nearest station. Right there, you can barely see the red, but that's a little wrench button. You press the wrench button, and it lock. You stick the stick the bike in first. Press the wrench button, it locks the bike in, puts a red light so that nobody else can take it out, so that they know that that bike needs to be serviced. And I had that happen recently. I I walked up to a station, and one of the bikes had a flat, and I just pressed the button, and so no one could take it out. And it, it also doesn't show up then in the app or on the website as being available. But if you have any problem with the bike, that's what you should do. 
If you're not near a station, you can call the customer service number. Yeah. Have you had any difficulties in balancing the supply and demand? We have. Um, we are, as I said, we're still learning, but it's, we've gotten better at it. And, and part of it is operations, and part of it, as I was saying, the Alta team that we work with is local here in Chicago. They're all, they were all hired locally. They're all Chicagoans. They're all, they all understand the conditions here. And for example, we recognized that Union Station was totally empty by 9 o'clock in the morning. And the station in front of the building where I work, which is 30 North LaSalle, LaSalle in Washington, is always full by 9 o'clock in the morning. So, um, and the same was in the reverse, at, at the end of the night, all the stations at Millennium Park, for example, or at the Cultural Center, those were all empty because everyone had ridden them west. So we, work, we worked actually with Alto very closely and realized that they were changing shifts on some of their people at six o'clock. So you had the rebalancing crews who were actually driving back to the operations center at the busiest time of the day when they should have been moving bikes. So they actually shifted, and, or they changed some of their shifts so that they actually have people who now work from 11 o'clock to nine o'clock um, instead of working from eight to six or whatever the original hours were so that they actually, there's continuity. There's someone always out there with, band, with bands rebalancing as needed so that you don't have that downtime. So we're, we're definitely learning. We've also worked with um, a couple we had some students, some grad students from uh, University of Chicago, I think, um, who did some predictive modeling for us. And we don't have enough data yet in Chicago, but essentially what they were doing is they were doing a, re a regression model that could actually predict full or empty conditions on the station so that rather than us waiting till we get noticed that the, the station is full or empty, we actually have some warning and we can send some, and, you know, we know predictively that in 30 minutes based on past data, the station is going to be empty. We need to go fill it right now. So we're we're working on that. We we only have three months of data, so you can't really do a good model with three months of data yet. But they've done that and had some success in DC and other places doing that predictive model. So we're definitely still learning. Theft. Any issues with theft? Two bikes. Only two bikes. It's um. Yeah, it's. I, I'm pleasantly surprised, I'll be totally honest. Um, we've only had two bikes stolen. We um, often, you know, the bike is so distinctive that if you see it out there on the street, um, it's pretty obvious. You can't, there's no aftermarket for the new bike. I mean, there really isn't. So, I mean, we found, we've, we occasionally get calls where someone will say, yeah, some, somebody left a bike, a did bike, in a bike, in a regular bike rack along the street. So we will dispatch someone to pick it up. We had an instance where some homeless guys were riding around a Dibby bike down Lower Wacker Drive. But our inspector, actually one of our CDOT inspectors saw it and we sent somebody out and picked it up. So we literally have only lost two bikes to date. A lot of time, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Some of the bikes will disappear for a week or two. They won't show up in the system and then they just show back up. Like somebody took it home and then they, you know, decided to return, but once, so it's, it's, it's really interesting, but, uh, yeah, if, if you, when you sign up, you do give, especially when you sign up for a membership or for a daily pass, you're using your credit or debit card, and so we can actually charge you for the bike if you don't return it. We usually don't, and if someone leaves it, we will if it, if it, totally disappears, but if it comes back, what you'll probably get is a stern email or phone message from our customer service people who will say, listen, you left this bike in this regular bike rack, if you do it again, we're going to charge you for it. Yeah, that is actually what it's like. <laughs> it's a finger wagging phone call, basically. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, when you were uh, talking about placing the actual locations, yeah. you, you mentioned that you pulled up an existing bike rack. Um, how has the reception been from the already established biking community and overall is the mission of Divi to get everyone riding Divis and that it might be cheaper than the initial cost of a, of a bike and then getting a lock and the, the risk of always securing it? Is the $75 a year 
is the idea that it's cheaper and more efficient to buy into this program than to do everything yourself? You know, ultimately, I think the short answer is both. I mean, we actually, we want more people on bikes. That's ultimately what it comes down to. If you want to ride a Divi bike, like I live in Lincoln Square, so it's, I've ridden it when I was really excited when we first got the Divi bikes before stations were out. I rode a Divi bike every day to work. It's about seven, between seven and eight miles from where I live. And it was exhausting. So I switched back to my own bike. But what we, what I do, and I, I do have my own bike, I, I ride it to work. But if I need to come here, it's much easier for me to grab a bike out of a Divi station, ride here, put it back in the Divi station. I don't need to worry about my bike. My bike is still locked up in the bike room in my building. I don't have to mess with anything else. I have a spare helmet that I keep in my office, and I'm good. So we're ultimately the goal is to get more people on bikes. Um, the other thing is we do recognize there are the bike rental services out there. And in fact, on our website, we suggest that if you want to ride a bike for four hours along the lakefront, there are better options, and we will tell you what they are. They're actually on our website. Um, so we. We also, and I don't have stats for Chicago, but I know in other places they have found that when bike share comes to a city, it actually leads more people, they first try Divi, like my wife will ride Divi bikes, she's not ridden a bike in years, but she, I got her to ride a Divi bike in downtown Chicago. Um, and so it's kind of the gateway drug, for lack of a better term, it gets people on a bike, and then they realize, wait, this actually isn't so bad, and then they actually go buy a bike at their local bike shop. Um, and that's so that's kind of I think they're complementary. I don't think they're mutually exclusive like already established uh, Have you heard at all from already established biking clubs or uh, Communities or even bike shops do they encourage like do they, do they behind this program? Do you know? uh, I know Act active transportation Alliance is we worked really closely with them um, And they actually helped us with some of the communications on some of the Divi stations. I think in general most you know other than a couple of the bike rental services, bike shops haven't, we've, I've not received, I've received literally zero complaints from bike shops, zero. Um, the, uh, so I, I think it overall, you know, that the bike community is supportive of it. Um, and uh, I think it just, you know, our goal is, is I think being met to actually get more people on bikes and using it as a mode of transportation so there's more of us out there and we're all visible and everyone respects everyone. I know it's a long-term goal, but there you go. Um, have you seen anything about uh, tracking injuries or anything like that? I think there was an article in the New York Times about the sea bites and actually uh, drunk biking and crashes. Um, we, I can't, as far as I know, we haven't had any incidents like that. We have had um, four crashes, three of them with taxis, not surprisingly. Um, one resulted, one of the four resulted in injuries that where the person had to seek medical attention. So they've all been relatively minor, um, and I'm not aware of anything like that, at least not that we're aware of so far. Uh, and like I, I said earlier, I don't know if you were in the room, but we encourage you, you can ride dip bikes wherever you want, to the bars or restaurants, but if you, if you can't drive, you shouldn't be biking either, so. So are you gonna be setting these up in some of the lower we already are. In fact, um, we have stations, basically as we rolled out, so we started in the center, we started, we did start in downtown because we knew that's where the most use would initially be concentrated. Um, but that was in June. Since then, we've built out, and we're to about 47th, I think, right now on the south, and we just got, I live at Lawrence on the north, which is 4800 north. We're, we're actually building out in both directions. Um, ultimately, we've got stations going in at 57th in the metro, we've got stations going in um, on the University of Chicago campus, and we will be going a little bit further north this year. In fact, I think we just went to Argyle um, and Berwyn along Broadway in Uptown. So we are expanding everywhere. We're, we're gonna be down next year in Inglewood, and we're gonna be up to Devon. So, um, and we're also working on, you know, I think the other issue that we're thinking about is, we want to put these stations in communities throughout Chicago, but how do we get people to actually use them too? And so we're still kind of working on that. And I'm, I've got some, I've had some conversations, and we're doing so. We're going to be doing some meetings this uh, this fall 
talking to some partners in community economic development groups, um, churches, church pastors, and other uh, groups to actually see you know, what we can do to partner with those organizations to actually get their members, because um, they're respected in those communities, get them to kind of help us share those, share the message and give people like any bikes. So once you recognize that it's, I mean, the other thing is if you can't afford $75, we're even working on options where it's a, either a reduced rate or spread the $75 over 12 months, which becomes, you know, less than $7 a month. So. too much about um, the education piece of this whole thing because you know people need to be more educated about the whole fact that it's rolling out. I mean I know people see them but that's they still don't know what's going on. And also the other piece about uh, the voters and you know that whole piece and you know responsibility for you know following the rules and the same thing for the the, the, the cycles. I think you should that we should take that up a whole notch. Yeah. Just, you know, because we're not the most bike friendly uh, city. I mean, we're getting better about it, but there are a lot of cities that are a lot, but you know, a lot more uh, bike friendly minded. Right. So we really need to, to do that. And I'm just wondering uh, if you're thinking about it, I'm sure you're thinking about it, but maybe what you had in mind. Yeah, from the. Um from the Divi's perspective, we actually, every bike has um, safety, a safety message right on the stem cap, so right up by the handlebars. When you look down, it actually says, walk bike on sidewalks, obey all traffic laws. So we're, we put it right there in people's faces to remind them what to do. Um, if you sign up for an annual membership, you also get a, um, a brochure that we put together with the Active Transportation Alliance. It's, it's called Everyday Biking. Um, and it actually has practical tips about how to ride safely, how to, how to obey traffic laws, all those sorts of things. Um, from a motorist perspective, I don't know, what do you think, Sarah? It's a little more challenging. We don't control, like the rules of the road are actually Secretary of State at the Illinois level. Um, it's a little bit harder to get that information out. Part of it is having more infrastructure out there and as people see it and recognize it, um, you know, it's, it's just kind of learning. Part of it is enforcement, part of it is speed cameras and some of the things that we're doing like that. It's, it's a whole suite of tools to get people to slow down, to drive more respectfully, um, and pedestrians and bicyclists also be more respectful too. But it's all, all of those things working together to make it successful. Sean, this is really been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Thank sure. you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> My co-presenter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>